So good morning and uh, welcome to the early shift. And I hope you all manage your camp, the, your, the ones that are camping and glamping have managed to, to get here. We've still got people coming in. So um, I've been tasked this, uh, this year um, to, uh, with, a chal- with a challenge from, from the Cherry family. Does it make financial sense to, do, to go regen agriculture in the current economic climate? Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have a discussion on that. So I'm Gary Markham from Land Family Business, which is a business I own, which is uh, accountancy and uh, a tax uh, for farms and estates, rural, rural businesses as well. So that's me. That's me up there. So I'm very delighted that uh, I'm joined by Ian Watson, who is on the far side here. And Ian is uh, uh, from his own business, Elite Farmers, uh, uh, which is a buying group. And so uh, uh, I think you do four inputs, Ian, is that right? Yeah, the, the four main inputs, seeds, fertilizer, chemicals, and diesel. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, good. So, so we're joined by, by Ian. And then in the middle, we've got Mike Pennell uh, from Whitbread Farms, uh, who has been on a journey, uh, he tells us, and he'll be talking about that journey a bit later on. Here next to me is Roger Davis from Indigro, who are... Uh, uh, agronomist, consultant agronomist, I guess, who've got a stand just down the corner, around the corner here as well. Uh, so delighted that uh, all three of those uh, are able to join. So what I thought I would do to um, start off with, I press this not too much. So that's, uh, no, so we'll come back to that, that at the end. Um, does it make financial sense? So what I was going to do was to go through some of the, n- the numbers that we have been benchmarking over the last five or six years now and have a look uh, to see what, uh, whether it's stacked up in the past and then apply some current numbers to it and have an input from these three specialists who know more about it than I do. Um, so, story so far, let's look, uh, let's look at this. So this is a a four-year average, and and I've got these as a handout on our stand, which is up by the big top if you want to to see these figures. So the four-year average of regen agriculture. uh, And so we've been benchmarking not a huge amount of farmers. It's about 15 to 20 farms, but it's it's the ones that do regen agriculture, and some of them are quite big. There are states as well of several thousand acres uh, each one. Uh, so, so variable costs um, per hectare over this four-year period is £112 less uh, than conventional farming. So in our own business of land family business, we have uh, up to 100,000 acres that we look after and we benchmark conventional farming versus this. So this is the, this is the comparison, if you like, £112 per, uh, per acre, per hectare, sorry, less. Uh, and labour and machinery costs which is a key point, £155 less. Uh, And the output, now I've put a little note in here because the 21 harvest we're finding coming through in in accounts and conventional farming is quite high, Um, so so, which is a bit of a blip. So we've actually excluded them at this stage. Um, So it's output per hectare over three years, um, excluding the 21 harvest is £244. So over that period, and that's a, a, an ongoing period of four years, about three years of, out, of average output. The margin in um, uh, regen agriculture group is £23 per hectare more. Uh, but that's only per hectare, of course, and it varies, and there's quite a variation in all of these numbers. So averages are averages. But it gives, does give you know, a, a, fairly good, a fairly good indication. And the indication is, is that about the same. And I've said this every year here, over the last four, five, six years, however long, long it's been going, that regen agriculture financially, if you get it right, and I think perhaps Mike might say a bit about this, about getting it right, because not everybody gets it right, and there's a huge variation in all the numbers we do in, in, the, in the standard agriculture and regen agriculture. Um, so it, it's about the same, but there's huge differences to get that same, and that's the key point, and, it, and, and that's where... Many, many farmers uh, are looking uh, on this journey, if you like, which Mike Pennell here has, has been on. Okay, so I mentioned um, machinery, um, uh, labour machinery here, £155 per, 
hectare less. So we, the, the, the largest cost for arable farming, I believe, is, is machinery. And, and, the, and the, the capital um, per, sorry, just per acre for a minute, the capital per acre in, in the last several four or five years has gone up from 200 to 250, up, way up below, above 300 to 350, 320 to 350 pounds per acre. That is a dip. Multiply by two and a half, you get you get per hectare, of course. So there's a lot of capital tied up, and so the, the inflation in, in machinery has been going on for several years now, and and in my opinion, that destroys the viability of arable farming unless you are really a performing and good land, etc. So the the average farmer really struggles in, in 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 our client base to make a reasonable margin over the last few years. Obviously, I haven't got to the current prices of fertilizer or crops, etc. at the moment. You know, we're just talking the, the past, uh, over the past. So let's look at machinery in a bit more detail. So the machinery capital per hectare is £70 pound lower in Regen Ag. Okay, and I, I've, as I said, I've got a handout with a full A4 page full of numbers on our, back on our stand if you want to come and collect it afterwards. So machinery capital per, so that's working capital tied up, okay? And, and, and the economists would say it's, it's, it's an investment in def deferred rust, basically, because that's what it ends up as. Uh, but it's £70 per, he per hectare lower uh, over that, over that four-year period. So the machinery capital per tonne, historically, there's been about, a nine, uh, about £20 uh, per tonne difference. But as yields have increased in conventional farming in the last, particularly the last year, so that's about the same now. So machinery capital per tonne, historically, even though there's a lower yield in Regen Ag on average, there's uh, the machinery capital per tonne is, is in Regen Ag is about 90, and in conventional farming, 110. And, and, and it's been consistent all the way through. So even though uh, there's, a, there's a lower machinery capital, there's a lower yield as well. That's why we wanted to look at that benchmark. And then this is a new one we've, we've introduced now, which is access to machinery. So many farms now um, hire in equipment um, or hiring contractors. So looking just at machinery depreciation on its own doesn't give the correct answer. So you need to add depreciation, machinery, hire and contracting fees. And that's why we call it access to machinery to, to run your arable enterprise. Okay. And when you look at that, it's 186 pounds per hectare lower in Regen Ag. Okay. So I did mention the, 20, the, the, the 21 uh, harvest yields, and we're coming on to that now. So the 21 harvest yields, um, um, and we still haven't reached the 300 pound a ton yet, of course, which, which is what we're coming to. To, 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 look, to look at, does it stack up, or do they, how, how they compare. So the output, um, based on the yield difference, is £659 uh, lower. Uh, the margin, uh, so the margin in LFB is 446, and the margin, uh, so that's a conventional farming land, for our land family business clients. Margin in Groundswell, 277, difference per hectare, 169. Okay, so that's based on the yield difference of the 21 harvest. So, so therefore, so there's a quite a large difference appearing. So we've looked up for the four years, and it's about the same. Uh, and what's happening last year? Huge, huge yields coming in over 10 tons a hectare. Many farms uh, for the 20, 21 harvest, and that's starting to show a difference. Okay, so so it's 169 pound lower uh, at. Uh, uh, at these these yields, so let let's come up to up to date, and and let's put in uh, three hundred pound a ton, uh, which will be the next slide. So if we put in three hundred pound a ton uh, on on those figures, now this is just a, a very um, a, a global view. We haven't gone into a lot of detail. Obviously, there are, there are. There are less variable costs, and so there's, a, there's less of an impact in fertilizer prices in, in Regen Ag. Um, so let's look at this. So this, this is frightening. So the groundswell mark at 300 pounds a ton, using those figures, the groundswell margin uh, per, per hectare, 1536, LFB margins 2000. 
Okay, we've got five. Uh, because we've got that yield difference on average, so, and, and this is quite, quite a difference now at 300 pound a tonne. So um, I'm just going to ask Peter Collier, who is down here, to say a few words. So Peter uh, works for CRM uh, and who uh, advise farmers on when to sell. So Peter, what I'd like to do is to, sorry, I will come to the panel. <laughs> I'm going to the audience first, I know. But Peter, could you say, t tell us how long you think we're going to have it? Because if we've got this 300 pound a tonne, or roughly, you know, that sort, that sort of level coming in, this difference is going to continue for some time uh, with, with that yield difference. Okay, Peter, a few minutes, please. Thanks. Is that working? Yeah, it is. Well, I've had a crystal ball that made my job a lot easier. Yeah. Um, what we do is we have to look at the risks. But first of all, let's look at why we are at this level in the first place. It's all due to the war in Ukraine predominantly. But prior to that, the world was very tight in stocks too, due to Chinese buying a lot of US corn. So we're in a very tight situation. Obviously, Russia invaded Ukraine, and that caused a lot of buyers to come into the market. Now, the timing is critical here. It happened at a time where farmer selling starts to reduce. Obviously, it happened late spring. Farmers are running out of old crop. That natural sell in the market started to dry up, and new crop sort of panic arrived from a buyer's perspective, and that drove markets to these exceptional levels we've seen. So in a nutshell, that's why we're at this exceptional level. Now, looking ahead, and our job is all to do with looking at risk, and from now on, farmers are the natural seller. We have seen a fall in markets, and that is as we approach harvest, farming confidence increases globally, not only in the UK, Europe, but also the US as well. And we've got to remember that there's a long way to go into a harvest globally, so we're likely to see continued selling pressure, certainly up until at least September when we see that US crop coming on board, and the global stock level just starts to increase again. Again, the whole point of why markets rose was panic about Ukraine. Now, Again, the downside risk is looking to Russia. It's the largest wheat exporter in the world. Forecast this year to produce nearly 80, 85, nearly even 89 million tons of wheat. Okay. And who isn't going to buy? We're all very capable of sitting here in this room and trying to shun Russia and trying to impose sanctions from a Western world perspective. But what nation isn't going to buy Russian wheat? Is Egypt not going to buy? Well, last time there was an inability to purchase, we had the Arab Spring. So that's unlikely. So there is a lot of risk in this market from a downside perspective. I don't think we can assume it's going to continue at these high levels, certainly in the long term. On the even longer term, and again, there is a sort of doubt on this market, but look back to 2012 when we last had a huge rally in prices, and every single season fell up until 2017 after that. You know, the whole point of higher prices is to increase and encourage production, and that's in a global aspect. So this high price this year will incentivize the following year, and again that year will incentivize the following year. And every time we've seen a huge rally in markets, we've often seen three to four seasons worth of, on average, um, decline throughout the next few seasons. So it's certainly not a continued sort of bullish long-term aspect, or at least we all need to be wary of the downside um, potential in this market as well, especially as inflation has come back into the world. And we've got banks now increasing interest rates. The entire point of this is to reduce consumption. You know, on a personal level, I might be driving less, I might be consuming less. On a global level, this is fairly significant. And that's why we've seen crude prices start to tail off as well. And again, remember, 40% of US corn goes into fuel. It's a significant chunk. So there's a lot of unseen in this market. We could easily have a drought. We could have any a number of potential events. I mean, who would have seen Russia invade in Ukraine? This market could easily be pushed high by these unforeseen events. But if we don't, I think we just could be aware that such strong margins are probably unlikely to be sustained in the long term. And in a global market, the market doesn't care about your margins in the UK. You're competing against Russia. Their input costs are a lot less. So, Peter, just in summarising, uh, what would you sell? Um, what would you sell this crop for now, average? And what about <laughs> next year and the year afterwards? Okay, just so just in, in three in three numbers. As a broad as a broad brush, um, we pull as all business, that together. We, as as broad brush as business, we're the most sold forward as we've ever been. Right. Yeah, especially looking towards November 23 Give as well. Give us the numbers. It's, it's the oldest hedge in the book. If you buy an input, sell an output. You know, protect your margin. If you're buying fur to any other input, look at selling some crop as well as a hedge to that margin. What's, how much per tonne? Uh, Come well, on. If you're looking off 23, 257 on the board, you probably get X farm round here in the high 240s in the feed base. Right. 23 and currently, I don't know, 
That's yeah, for this harvest. Next, next that's, that's the following harvest. Right, following, following harvest. Twenty-three yeah. harvest, 250. two fifty. Okay. Yeah, two fifty. Be be okay. bold. Probably okay. more like two forty, uh, given the current risks. Okay. And then after that, dropping off is what you're saying. You're that's saying. what we've seen every single time. We've seen okay. a big spike in global markets. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Okay. So the, 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 we're, we haven't. We must get to the panel. So if anybody wants to ask a question, put put your, put your hands up. We can ask questions as we go. Basically, we've got an hour to go. So. Um, so I just want to conclude on this bit before uh, introducing introducing the panel in. So so um, I, I was by popular demand uh, we've started um, benchmarking nitrogen, and, and um, so I've just got a slide and the, and nitrogen will be discussed uh, a bit later on. So we're looking at nitrogen in regen versus conventional farming, uh, which is very very timely. Um, as, as Ian will, will talk about fertilizer prices in, in a minute. So, so these are the first indications uh, of, uh, of nitrogen, and I'm, uh, I'm pleased that Kelly Price is here from, from Agreed Earth. Is that right? Agreed, Kelly Price from Agreed Earth is here, who, who actually contacted me several months ago uh, and suggested that we should start, start uh, looking at, at nitrogen uh, benchmarking and uh, and it's and it's created a lot of interest, particularly with these boys. And yeah, yeah. When I spoke to Roger about it, he said, "Of course, you should be doing it." So, which is good. So, look at look at these numbers. So, uh, winter wheat uh, LFB, or conventional farming, of course, uh, 31.74 kilograms per ton. This is not per hectare or per acre. This is so it's kilograms per ton we're looking at. And uh, versus 22.7. All seed rape, a huge difference there. So these are early indications, and I think, Roger, you would agree with that sort of trend, yeah, in regen versus, uh, yeah, yeah. Good, okay, so, so that's, the, that's the background. Are there any questions at this stage before I, I I'm going to introduce Roger now. Um, no, sorry, I'm going to quick, quickly ask Ian after, after Peter. So Ian, in input prices, if we go back to go back to this 500 pound worst margin in regen ag is where we're at you know um, so fertilizer prices uh, obviously we, most of our clients have bought reasonably well for this harvest and the, the price has dropped back a little bit uh, for next harvest but next harvest is meant to be the crunch time particularly we're selling at 250 uh, over there so I'm not an option here but yes uh, Ian, Ian how much our fertilizer price is going to be moving to, 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 to make this difference of £500, which is a bit bad news at the moment, isn't it? Uh, is this on? Uh, yes, it is. I think if you're going to um, manage fertilizer risks, the first thing is don't be totally exposed by not buying or buying and not selling. So the most important market to follow is urea, which is probably... 61% of the um, world nitrogen consumption. Um, soil nutrition, rotations, uh, crop establishment help uh, reduce our reliance of bags fertilizer, uh, whether that be starter fertilizer, straight N, NNS, phosphate, potash, you, you, you need them. So prices, for urea today are probably 150 to 160 a kilo. Uh, AN started at 180, it's now 220 a kilo. Uh, liquid is probably 190 to two pounds a kilo. Of N, my view with the current prices, you should be buying product, um, at least half of it. Uh, it's very political. in. <coughs> In Europe, uh, dear Mr. Putin has um, decided to cut back on gas supplies to Germany, to Italy, and there. So that's going to maybe shut some of the plants in Europe. When we get to urea, urea is now at its lowest level in America that it's been. So we've got urea low and we've got um, gas supplies very high. Everything's dependent on Ukraine and uh, the war there. The one product which is very, very short is sulfur. 
So if you're just wanting me to go black and white, Thank buy you. your sulphur, get half your nitrogen bought, and if you're buying the nitrogen, or if you haven't already, offset it against some grain sales. Going forward, everything, as I said, is to do with the war. Uh, more gas supplies, nitrogen would come down. Cutting gas supplies, product would go up. This morning on the radio, they said there's going to be a shortage of gas throughout Europe. So urea, if you can use it in your, um, as one of your products, I think would be the product going forward. I personally like liquid nitrogen because it's much more accurate. Every droplet's going exactly where it is. But I'll be having discussions with our liquid suppliers about why is there a 25% premium for liquid over urea. Is that a black and white answer? Oh, yeah, thank you, Ian. Okay. So any, any questions at this moment? We've got a question from Mr. Yagro. We, you, it's a microphone on its way to you. D thank you. Did I understand on the previous slide, sorry, Gary, the that the yield difference is on average 25% between? Yeah, it's, it's about 20%, so, but it's, it's, it's a larger yield difference. On that slide, um, it's about 7.5 tonnes versus, versus 10. Okay. Because 10 is quite high. Yes. Yeah. So that, 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 that's where that that's the results that are coming through at the moment. There's a huge variation, Dan. Obviously, yeah. but but that, those are the these these are the ones that are coming through now in our accounts for the twenty one harvest. Oh, okay. For a single yeah. year. Okay. Yeah. We're always always behind as accountants. Remember. And is the the on the next slide? I think there's um, nitrogen usage, nitrogen use efficiency, or a version thereof. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is that so? Is, are the LFB farmers putting more nitrogen on? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and it's so uh, more nitrogen, and it's and this is per, per kilogram per ton. Yeah, so not, not per acre. Yeah, yeah. E even though there's higher tons, there's higher tons. There's, there's yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and obviously the key points what Ian was saying now. Obviously, uh, it's it's the. Uh, uh, the, the the groundswell group, if you like, are using less fertilizer, so it's going to be less cost, and, and I think that's the key message. Okay, thanks, Dan. Thanks. Anything? Anybody else at this moment? Before I'm going to hand over to some very technical stuff on my left, um, to um, to Roger Davis. I've worked with Roger for the last 25, 30 years or so, or whatever it is. Seems a long time uh, 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 with clients. So fertilizer use versus uh, yield in winter wheat. Just a few points about that. So this is a. I hope you can see that, but uh, Roger will now talk us through uh, through this slide. Okay, Roger. Okay. Uh, you can stand up. Is that on? Yeah, you're on. Yeah, yeah. I'm on. Um, well, actually, you say it's. Yeah, it is probably 25 years. Um, 20 years ago, Gary put me in the same position in the Kettering Park Hotel yes. to talk about growing wheat at 60 pounds a ton. So um, that just goes to show how sort of volatile the market is and how vulnerable our, our business can be. And uh, the issues, I can't remember what they were in the day, but we're now facing, you know, increased costs, reducing BPS um, pressure from uh, climate change and the, the need to go net zero and uh, obviously food security, as Peter alluded to. Um, um, my own thoughts, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room would agree with me that uh, a business strategy like regen farming would be the right approach to take our businesses forward um, and build in our resilience by um, making sure that we've got uh, uh, our soils in good order and that our business is resilient for the future. Also, uh, reliance or less reliance on uh, inorganic uh, fertilizer and uh, buying inexpensive machinery that's running on very expensive fuel. But making um, less money at the moment. Yeah, um, and also uh, reducing our risk. So um, from a financial exposure point of view and from a uh, rotational point of view, so uh, broadening our rotations so that we don't, we're not so uh, vulnerable to uh, weather and, um, and other aspects. And also uh, look at some of the rewards. There's going to be uh, greater rewards to those that do this well and as Gary said, it's all about doing this well and attention to detail. Um, 
Well, if you go down the re uh, regen route, I think that your uh, profits will be more reliable and consistent. And I think you obviously gain from your environmental aspects on the farm and natural capital assets as well. Um, there's also potential for additional uh, rewards, if you like. So uh, you've got um, your product premiums, hopefully, and quality. You've also got stewardship. So uh, a lot of you guys are probably doing SW6 and AB14. Thanks, Mike. Um, and also, you know, we've been talking to water companies and, you know, we're saying that we're, we're doing the right thing upstream, if you like, at source. So um, why not give us the, some of the money that they're saving for having to clean out uh, pesticides from water, et cetera, and nitrogen? Um, and also there's the, uh, the big thing of carbon, which uh, I'm sure you all heard lots of uh, carbon talk uh, whilst you've been here in the last day or two. Um, and in my opinion, carbon is um, uh, the greatest measure of success. And the more we look at it, the more we see that the soil organic matter increases yield, increases our gross margin and uh, food quality. Um, so in two, for the last two years uh, at Indgro, we've done a survey through the Cool Farm tool, and we're proud members of the Cool Farm Alliance, which uh, enables us to benchmark our figures through the Cool Farm Alliance. Um, it's been a very useful uh, project, really, on the survey, because it gives us an uh, ideal opportunity to uh, look at our key performance indicators, and from that, we're advising clients and discussing with clients where they need to change their businesses. Um, we had 40 farmers uh, enter the uh, survey this year um, and uh, delighted that the Whitbread Farms entered. Uh, I've been uh, working with the Whitbread family for over 20 years now and uh, seen them go through uh, from conventional to uh, regen uh, and very successfully. And I'm sure Mike will tell us more about that in a moment. Uh, within the 40 farmers, we had uh, around about 50% conventional and 50% uh, regen and one organic farmer. Um, and the figures that I'm going to show you are based on wheat. And so it's a real snapshot of, and if anybody wants to talk to me in greater depth about the, uh, the survey, then I'm sure we can um, talk in greater depth. But the, the snapshot is, is on wheat. So uh, if you just bear that in mind. So um, the first slide is uh, basically uh, our, our new nitrogen use efficiency slide. And uh, I'm not sure whether you can actually see that, but basically you've got your average yields going through the middle, the line going horizontally, and then vertically you've got the amount of nitrogen, uh, the average nitrogen going up. Now, if you look in the top left-hand corner, that's basically where you need to be uh, to, to be making money. And uh, ironically, nearly all of the regen farmers were up in that top left-hand corner. Now, some of those... To the right-hand side, are a bit. There's a few anomalies, but you know, one has to question uh, growing milling wheats and uh, whether you get the premium for the in, in, input. And so, those guys that are putting on 240, 250 kgs and beyond are, are probably trying to get quality wheats. So, you know, that they they could probably be a bit more vulnerable than 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 the others that are trying to grow feed wheats. Um, so, uh, next slide, if I may. Oh, look at that crazy thing. Um, so that is the summary of all of the, uh, the the forty farms, and you'll see along the bottom that there's a repeat of numbers, and that's because several farmers put several fields in. Um, if I can't really see it myself, but I'm guessing what's going on there. The the middle line, <laughs> the middle line is that uh, if you look at the middle line, the horizontal back line, uh, anything above that is the emissions. So the red line, the red bars are the nitrogen and the blue bars are any other emissions like fuel and pesticides, etc. cetera. Um, and the green line be uh, below the black line, the green bars rather, are the, are the sequestration figures. And the orange lines are the actual average sequestration or, em uh, or emissions and the black lines at the top are the yields. Um, now, I'm going to put Mike under pressure now, because if you can give me the next slide, please. So Mike, on the right-hand side, is number 34. Uh, you probably can't see that, but basically Mike is um, 
producing on that particular field nine tonnes of wheat and uh, uh, is a net emitter. And just to the left of that, I don't know whether you can see it, there's uh, of the, the circle on the, on the right-hand side, that that's the one organic farmer where his yields are low. Can you see the black line? The black line's actually touching the, the circle. And he is actually uh, still a net uh, emitter as an organic farmer. And then if we come over to the left-hand circle, uh, this guy's been doing regen for actually longer than the Whitbreads. And um, you can see that he's got... He actually put in four fields, and the, uh, two of which are light and two of which are heavy, which was useful. And his yields were consistent at 10 tonnes, and uh, his emissions were very, very consistent at, uh, at three tonnes. So that gives you some sort of summary. And then in between all that, you've got conventional farmers, and we haven't got time to go through it today, but you know the, the highlights there are that uh, most of the farmers that are regen are uh, net sequesterers. Um, and to answer your question, Gary, just on the 40 farms... The average yield for all of those guys, you can see, is uh, 8.6, which is where the black line goes across. Uh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, whichever line, I can't see it. Uh, and then the conventional farmers were actually 8.2 tonnes, and the regen farms were actually 9.3. So... Uh, Obviously, your influence, your advice. Well... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, so hopefully that gives you some sort of summary. We, sure. we are finding that the regen farmers are probably good, better farmers, and also their attention to detail is greater, and they are lowering their inputs, keeping uh, the vulnerability and the uh, vol uh, I, volatility to I think that's a, a very good level. point, Roger, because um, I've been benchmarking since 1992, actually, um, uh, in, in uh, land family business, conventional farming, and huge range. There's yeah. a huge range of results all the way through, uh, and that's that's for various reasons, but mainly people, attention yeah. to detail, focused. And, and I've been saying the last few years whether it's a dysfunctional family that's behind it, because if you've got a dysfunctional family, there's lots of us around, dysfunctional farmers, uh, fam, uh, families in farming, and it just you're you're fighting each other rather than focusing on the. Uh, on, on the job in hand quite often. There's lots of these yeah. influences. I do a I'd lot agree. of work on this. So the key point is, yes, that the best performers in both sides would be... Would and be and one of the other key things that I didn't really mention, but obviously we're doing it, is baselining. You know, let's, let's measure where we are now. There's a, a lot of guys moving into regen, and it's really important that we can actually measure our success. So we're, we're doing a lot of that work. Mm, sure. Good. Thanks, Roger. So any questions for... Um, yeah, so Kelly first... Yeah, there's a yeah. So this is Kelly Price from Agreed Earth, who I introduced earlier on, who persuaded me to to uh, benchmark nitrogen. Kelly, thanks, Gary. Um, just a quick question on this: How exactly? I assume this is CO two E as per the emissions. That's right. And how was it exactly calculated? Sorry, how? How was it calculated? How, so it's through the cal uh, the Cool Farm tool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just taking all of the metrics yep. that were input. And yeah. Okay. And, and you know you could argue that the models, um, you know, the models are a model, and they weren't designed necessarily to measure carbon in the first place, and certainly not to trade. But they are a model that we find really useful, just to uh, guide farmers through what their the levels of emissions and sequestrations are, and how they can change their practices to to best suit sequestration rather than emissions. Definitely, and I, I ask because we just received a grant from the European Space Agency to build a nitrous oxide monitoring tool with their Sentinel-5 satellite data, yeah. and so it would be very interesting to compare that to this because that will give an indication of nitrogen usage efficiency. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks. Louise, I think, what had your hand up? Yeah. Thanks, Louise. Hi, Roger. Just You mentioned premiums. For yeah. regen as additional rewards, can you expand on that a bit, please? Well, we're working quite hard on that one, and uh, it does seem to be quite a challenge. Um, but there is quite a lot of work. One in um, uh, some of you might have attended some of the pr uh, presentations uh, around the show, but we're working quite hard on trying to get nutritional values compared to conventional uh, farming, um, because you know, let's face it, if if we can imp increase the nutritional value and prove it then there's got to be 
uh, a premium for search, you would hope. Um, so yeah, we're not there yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, anybody else? Wait, I'm good, now going to ask... Um, Gary, Mike. can I just add on the yeah, premiums? Okay, um, sorry, very noticeable that Nestle have just... just about to introduce you. Sorry. Yeah, so go <laughs> on. I'll butt in anyway. Um, Nestle have just released a big press article about their support for regen farming and how it's the way forward and all the rest of it, listing everything that you know we already know about regen and want to know about regen. The only thing that's missing from it is actually a financial benefit of it. So, you know, they're there, thereabouts, but no one's actually willing to put their hand in the pocket yet. Yeah, I think we have to be really careful that they don't just use this as a marketing uh, yeah, thing and, and and that the farmers don't benefit. Mm, so sure, exactly, yeah. we all need to work hard on that one. Yeah, there's, yes, there's, we've got to be very wary of the marketing mm -hmm. marketplace at the moment. So uh, um, I introduced um, Mike earlier on. So he's uh, been on, a, you've been on a journey, Mike. And so uh, um, the next slide I'm going to put up. Um, so we've got here Whitbread Farms, whole farm rotational gross margin. And you can see this is the journey since 2012 to 22. Uh, Mike, over to you to just go through this and tell us what, what you've got. So basically, we've got three. You've got the rotational gross margin and what's coming up as well, just to make it exciting, whole farm nitrogen use and for whole farm ag chem use on this journey, which is going to be really interesting, I think. Mike, thanks. Yeah, morning. Um, so hopefully you can see the, the figures on the, um, on the graph there, or at least the trends. So I've only been with the business now for the last three and a half years. So the early days back in uh, Mintil and direct drilling was more just figures taken off Gatekeeper and, and sort of, um, but, but, the, but the figures are still there. So back in 2012, like many farms, we were farming by gross margin from you know, nicks or whatever, um, wheat rape, wheat rape, wheat rape, um, doing a good job of growing wheat, a declining job of growing rape to the fact that then rape became unfarmable basically on, on the land that we were, or on the farm that we had. Um, and then the ag chem bill and the inputs were going up and up and up. So when the owner got wind of this, he sort of challenged the, the, the farming um, practice and we, we, we started this sort of, I hate the word journey, but we started this journey into direct drilling and then, then regen in the last, last few years. I, I do hold a difference between regen and, and direct drilling, um, but definitely now I'd say we're in the regen, regen end of things. So, I mean, if you looked at the, on the paper, a wheat rate rotation would still be your best gross margin, but the reality of delivering it day on day, you actually have to grow in some other crops that increase now to an eight-year rotation growing springs, growing winters, growing grasses, growing broad leaves, um, to get the soils, to get the, to get the risk. Um, and overall, you accept maybe uh, an on-paper drop in gross margin, but the reality is that the farm produces more gross margin across the rotation. Um, and I think that's the that's important thing, looking at the rotational gross margin, um, which well, there's blips. There's blips on yield. There's blips on prices. There's... There's blips on all sorts of stuff, but those are the figures off our accounts, and that's what they show, that we've got an increase in gross margin rotationally as we've moved into regen. And the next slide is our nitrogen use. Now, back to, back to Gary's basic question, does it make financial sense to do regen? If you look at us, most people that are doing regen or some form of regen, they'll talk about um, sustainability of their farming operation. Well, sustainability also covers financial sustainability because I can do all the things and have thousands and thousands of earthworms and all the rest of it. But if I'm making a loss every year and I'm bust, I'm not actually doing an awful lot for the future of, of, of the farm or the future generations. Um, and I think a lot of regen people um, focus on, I've gone regen, so what can I cut? And if you look at those nitrogen input um, graphs, very interesting how much less that... Um, that that regen ag is using compared to conventional ag. Now, maybe conventional ag are using too much and wasting some, but actually, is there too much focus, this is another talk, is there too much focus in regen about cutting stuff rather than just trying to farm to the same level as conventional farmers, but just fundamentally with a different cultivation technique? And then once you've kind of done that and you've got yourself established and your soils and you know what your soils are doing you then earn the right to start trying to cut year, cut inputs a bit 
but fundamentally, and I've had this discussion with Gary before, I don't agree that there should you should accept a yield deficit with regen compared to conventional farming. Because to use sort of emotive words, if my neglected, beaten up soils that I've ploughed and power harrowed for years can grow 10 tonne of wheat, if, I can d if I'm doing all this work to improve my soil health, to improve my organic matter, to improve my water infiltration, to improve my nutrient cycling and my nutrient retention, why on earth should I be saying, I'm now happy with seven and a half? Surely I sh should still be growing 10, if not 11. Um, so I don't accept that there's a yield. They should accept. I don't, I don't agree that we should think, I'm doing regen, I'm accepting a yield loss. Because at the minute, the only commodity I have to sell is wheat in my shed. There's hundreds of people here will tell you that we can sell carbon, but at the moment, we can't really sell carbon, and we certainly can't sell carbon for the same price as wheat. So at the minute, we could sell butterflies as well in the future with our, um, you know, our diversity net gain. But for the minute, that doesn't exist. The only measure I have to be financially sustainable is wheat in a shed. So where on the nitrogen use graph Harry, Gary had a minute ago showed that we were using 22 kilos of nitrogen rather than 35. Well, perhaps, and you've got to move things in, in, in where they are, perhaps in this year, it's the easiest year we've had since I've been a farm manager to work out that I can actually afford to put another 20, 30, 40 kilos of nitrogen on because the price of the commodity is so high. You hear, you hear so many farmers moaning about the price of fertilizer, but no one's moaning about the price of wheat. But on, an, on a normal year, and I'm sure everyone in this room has done the sums, if you're putting on 200 kilos of nitrogen at a pound a kilo, 200 quid, if you then put on a 200 kilos at two pound a kilo, your increase in cost has gone up 200 pounds a hectare, but your wheat's gone up, let's say, 100 pound a tonne on eight tonnes, you've got 800 pound increase in return. So it's a 600 pound return on investment of that nitrogen. So why not, rather than just being so focused on cut, 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 when our soils aren't ready for cut, 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 Let's actually, on a year like this, put a bit more on, get the yields up there, and we'll be making more money than the conventional boys. Um, I mean, having said that, we have, we have reduced um, nitrogen use, and in 2012, we were growing feed wheat. In 2019 onwards, we were growing group one milling. Now, last year, I'll be honest, I cocked it up, and we didn't put enough nitrogen on, and I didn't get the premium. Um, but with the prices where they are, to be honest with you, it hasn't really mattered too much. Um, but... The, 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 this, is our, this is applied artificial nitrogen. Obviously, we're, no, this is applied total nitrogen. We are trying to get more from an organic source, but that is hard work in a non-livestock area. Um, and we are measuring N-min testing in the spring to work out what we've got left after the winter. So just as a measure, we're trying to grow group one wheat. I think we've probably got well over nine tonne in the ground this year with 210 kilos of applied as a soil uh, as a farm standard practice but I've done a lot of work this year on foliar feeding different forms of nitrogen um, and I've got nit I've got milling wheat group two wheat rye barley and rape that have all received only just over 100 kilos of nitrogen um, th in the foliar program as well so that that isn't taken into account into these numbers. This is just soil applied, but there is a definitely a downside, a, a, a downward trend in nitrogen applied. And then the last graph, I can't remember what I showed in the last graph. Oh yeah, ag chem spend. Ag chem, yep. Well, I mean, it's dead easy. Um, it, back in the day, Roger was my agronomist, and then he kind of retired, and I got another one, and then our graph went down. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, what happened? Basically, this is wheat rate, wheat rape. I did train the other guy. <laughs> 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 wheat rape, wheat rape, and ag chem goes up, black grass out of control um, in the wheat, spraying off wheat before harvest because we couldn't get on the black grass after they've had full stack in the winter, a top up and a spring contact. You start growing some spring crops, you start growing some diversity, you've got different products to put on. So it's not about, again, it's not about reducing, reducing, reducing year on year. It's about seeing the cards that you dealt and dealing with it. But in that rotation, you have the option of um, different crops, different chemistry, uh, different control methods. It's as simple as that, really. Good. Thank, thank you very much, Mike. So are there any questions for, for, for Mike at the moment? No, good. We've got quarter of an hour, quarter of an hour left. Sorry? Oh, Dan. Sorry, you again. 
sorry, do, do you want to let's let everybody hear the question, please? So you hand the mic over. Thanks, Stan. Just a real simple question on uh, yields. How have they changed from 2012 to 2022? We've, they're up and down. I mean, 2020, let's face it, was horrible. Uh, we're on some fairly light land in places and it burnt off. Um, we're on some reasonably firm land, which in 2019 didn't get drilled, um, if I'm honest. So th they're up and down. Um, but in the past, previous farm managers could grow 10 tonne of milling wheat, feed wheat, um, and I want to grow 10 tonne of Ten ton of milling wheat. It's 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 kind of that simple. But yes, they're up and down, and obviously the whole farm yield has reduced because instead of growing a lot of first wheat, now we're growing more spring barley, which will never yield the same. So the so the, the overall, but it's not about yield; it's about margin. Okay, that gentleman at the very back, please. Mike's on his way. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, the question was, uh, you talked a lot about yields, um, and that's obviously just your cereal crop. Um, have you integrated livestock into your system? Uh, and if so, have you done any work to, to see, you know, not only am I producing a combinable crop, but I'm also pr providing grazing fodder, and therefore a second agricultural output, and whether that is making up any of your yields deficit? Thank you. Short answer is no. Um, I know that in livestock integration is kind of the next level that we need to go to. And I don't want to be one of these people that says, like a lot of people with regen, won't work on my land. But the setup of the farm is such that we kind of have no fences. We have no water around the farm. The, the, the cost of setting set up to put um, livestock on 12 months of the farm, it would be huge and the labouring um, requirements and all the rest of it. We, we get sheep on cover crops in the, in, over the winter. Um, we have a, um, a beef suckler enterprise, but they kind of stay on permanent pasture um, rather than on the uh, arable fields. Um, and I think it's one of these ones where actually, ultimately, when you're trying to do block farming on a broad acre farm, then your size can count against you because... If we were suddenly to put a block of, because the farm split up into 150 hectare blocks, so if you were to if you were to suddenly decide that 150 hectares was going into sheep, you're suddenly into sheep in a very very big way. Um, whereas if we had a field or two fields, I think it's a lot easier. But I don't really want to split uh, split the blocks up because I don't get too many inefficiencies in the arable operation. And and fundamentally, I am I am an arable farm manager with some livestock. This talk about the livestock, listening to the rain on the roof, and I've got hay on the floor that needs bailing this afternoon. <laughs> yes. 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 Good. Um, thank you. Any anybody else? So we're coming. We're coming to a close. We've only got few, a few a few minutes left. So there's somebody here. Yes. Sorry. Got, yeah. Hi there. Could you just clarify the major difference between uh, your direct drilling and your regen ag? Uh. Everybody's got a different definition of regen ag and everything else. Now, direct drilling for me is a cultivation policy. You can, you're just not, you're not making your soil brown. You're going into stubble or whatever and you're drilling. It doesn't involve necessarily uh, cover crops, catch crops, rotation, um, spring cropping, the, the, the whole diversity. So, once for, so for me, once you go into regen ag, that's when you start looking at, you know, whole farm picture, you start looking at, um, soil health. You direct drilling in its worst form is just a cultivation policy. Okay. Any anybody? Else? We're, we're, we've got just a, f a few minutes left, so I've put the uh, the challenge uh, back up. And and if you recall, that uh, um, I, I look back over four four years, and it's the regen. Uh, group that we we monitor compared with uh, with our traditional clients, it's about the same. But obviously, we've had a blip basically with the, with the fertilizer prices we've heard, and from Peter down here that uh, that, that the prices at the moment and at three hundred pound a ton, it was five hundred pound per hectare difference in margin. But I, I guess it's a blip. You would make more money at the moment, on average. And I understand we, Mike and I have always had this debate about. But we 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 benchmark a group of farmers that do have, on average, lower yields. Um, Whitbread Farms is, is in our benchmarking group, uh, obviously, but so therefore there's a quite a range of results. And I think it's just fo focus on the job, basically, as, as we've 
as we as we all, all say. So um, just to finish off, it's, it's, obviously you're going to be around for a few minutes, and I think it's probably not raining in Bedfordshire, just in Hertfordshire, okay? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, just, to, just to finish up, uh, I think, you know, I, I can conclude, because uh, I've been coming, coming here every year, I think, of course it does, you know, I think farming is a long-term long job, not, not just r r ch chasing, chasing the money. Um, I do have clients that just chase the money, but how long can they do that for? Um, I don't know. They, it's, it's sustainability, isn't it? Does that, do you want to add anything yeah. more to that? I, th I think if you look long term, the biggest threat to farming isn't about input prices or commodity prices. The biggest threat to farming is, to use someone else's term, we've got six inches of dirt that sustains life on Earth, and it's got to be climate change. And surely, yeah. from what I've seen and what you hear from other speakers around the place, is if you go down this regen route, you are mitigating against some of the risk from, from soil erosion and, from, and you're making your soils more resilient to these extreme weather events yeah. compared to... A conventional farm but that is on the time scale that isn't in the next one two or three years so that's that's the balance that we've got to, we've got to we've got to weigh up thanks mike that's a very very good end so closing it now where we um the panel are going to be here um uh, all the numbers i've used and there's more detail behind them are on our stand up by the the big top as it's called up up there so thank you all very much and thank you for the questions uh, and uh, I hope you have a good day in the rain. Yes. Thank you.